something that site owners depend very much on the uh, green environment that surrounds them and the area to live in because we want to conserve aquatic life. So we've invited uh, the Canadian Wildlife Service here today to be talking to you about this uh, proposal to make the Side Islands a protected area. And it's also a follow-up to an event that we did in March, March 25th, where we hosted the Conservation General in Oxford Open Society. And we had a couple of other experts here talking about the importance of marine protected areas, why we need them. And uh, it just happened to work out that on the eve of a political election here in BC, uh, we have this opportunity for the public to be engaged in making a protected area. Uh, so we thought that this was very timely. And uh, we're very happy to have everyone here tonight. And we hope that you will take the opportunity to get the information tonight and make some public comments. Uh, those comments will come with your enclosures on May 25th. Uh, and those comments can go to help start uh, or to help support the protected area that's proposed in the side island. Uh, so we're going to have uh, uh, one major speaker this evening. But I'm going to introduce the person that's going to introduce the kids uh, as soon as we get back. So I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Barry Smith, who is the uh, unit head, excuse me, regional director. Sorry, Barry, I told you I was going to address that one. The regional director of the Canadian Wildlife Service in the Pacific Sea Province, BC. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jonathan, and uh, I won't take too much time here because uh, I will introduce Blair in, in a few minutes and uh, he'll tell you all about Scott Islands, but I thought I would take just a little bit of an opportunity just to tell you about the Canadian Wildlife Service itself and uh, what our mandate is and how this particular exercise fits into uh, our mandate. The Canadian Wildlife Service has been around for, for quite a long time. We just had our 65th anniversary uh, last year. and. Uh, we are a branch, well, not even a branch, a division within Environment Canada. So we're embedded within the Department of Environment. Minister uh, Peter Kent is uh, our uh, federal minister. And uh, our mandate is focused on basically three key items. We are responsible for the well-being of migratory birds in Canada. And some of you may know not, that not all birds are migratory birds. There is a division of birds that are provincial responsibility of those that are federal responsibility. The federal, those are federal responsibility as part of a treaty between Canada and the U.S. where we agreed uh, almost 100 years ago to co-manage those species for their well-being. Uh, we are also responsible under another act of parliament, the Species at Risk Act, for the recovery and uh, protection of species at risk in Canada. And uh, sometimes when I talk to people, they're surprised to find out how many species at risk there are in Canada. Somebody might say, well, I think there's three or four, maybe the killer whale and spotted owl and caribou and a couple of others. But actually there are, the Species at Risk Act at this time has more than 500 species listed that are either threatened, endangered, or special concern. It's a big number, it surprises a lot of people. A third element of what we do is protecting habitat that's important for Canadian wildlife at a national scale. And we've been doing that for many, many years, since our existence essentially, and even before our existence, the first national wildlife uh, area or its equivalent protected area was more than 100 years of Pass Mountain Lake in Saskatchewan. But virtually all of that effort has been on land uh, until very recently. And one of the big impetus for us to do more at sea came from commitments that Canada has made federally uh, to protect more ocean habitat uh, for the well-being not only of the species that we want to use, but the species that we want to look at. And ostensibly, we'd like to get somewhere in the order of 10% of Canada's coastal areas protected to some degree. So. The Scott Islands Marine National Wildlife Area, which Blair will tell you is coming close to a completion, uh, but it's, it's been in the works for a long period of time, but the real impetus came with the federal budget in 2007, 
where the current government actually made a commitment that we would have, that they would have us within the, the Canadian Wildlife Service work to have that wildlife area ready for designation by the end of 2012. And we've almost made it. Where the timeline slipped a little bit, but that commitment is continuing, and that commitment was reaffirmed in the most recent budget. So we're really looking forward to, in the next year or so, to have Canada's very first marine national wildlife area designated. Uh, and we'll be here on the west coast off the northwest tip of Vancouver Island. So that's all I'm going to say about that to give you a little bit of context. And I will now introduce the key speaker for tonight, which is Blair Hammond. Blair is my manager of ecosystem conservation at uh, the Canadian Wildlife Service here in Pacific Yukon region. His office, my office, is at the Pacific Wildlife Research Centre, which is on Western Island and out at the uh, very mouth of the Fraser River across from Steveston. Blair has been with us for roughly 13 years, and as I mentioned most recently, uh, and for the last, I'll say roughly four years as our manager of ecosystem conservation. Before that, he worked for the British Columbia Conservation Foundation, and he was also a research associate at both the University of Alberta and, and the University of British Columbia. And this particular project has, and I dare I call it a project, but this great initiative actually has been probably the one of the leading efforts that Blair and his group have been working on in the past three or four years, essentially since he's been in that position. But as he'll tell you, the efforts actually started well before that. But I'll let him tell you the whole story. So without further ado, I'll invite Blair Hammond to the podium to uh, tell you about how we've gotten to this point with uh, Scott Island's Green Wildlife Area. Thanks, Blair. Barry. Thanks very much. People hear me OK? If I'm not loud enough at any time, if I move away through the mic or anything like that, uh, please just let me know that you can't hear me. Um, and also, if I'm making strange faces, I do have a, a rather bright light up there staring me in the face. So make sure the camera, because I guess we're being webcast tonight as well. So, um, And I will say I'm a little overwhelmed by the size of the screen. Uh, so hopefully the images all project well on a screen this large. Um, it's a first for me having such a big screen to go against. So we'll see how this works. And uh, I think we've given you the, the tip-off as to where the Scott Islands are. Has anyone spent any time in the water up in northern Vancouver Island at all? Yeah, a little bit, a couple of people. So it's a, I think for a lot of people, they think of that part of the province as the back of the beyond, uh, end of the road, quite literally. Um, but I think, as you'll see, there's a, there's a lot of good reasons to be interested in the area. We're going to start off with a little video, um, and it's, we unfortunately had to put it off YouTube because they, we tried to tried to move it off our network today, and we had some, some bugs, and it's a big file. So it's a little, a little grainy. But this is video that was shot by the Vancouver Aquarium High Def Film Crew. We brought, out, brought them out there a few years back when they really got going again with the Scott Islands process because we thought it was really important that we capture some really good imagery of what the area is like because it's not a place that most Canadians are ever going to be able to get to. It's a long way out. It is a perfect place to determine whether or not you'll ever get seasick. Uh, the weather is terrible, so you can almost never fly over it. But as the fates would have it, the one week uh, we went out there, it was stormy on the way out to remind everyone that it can be stormy out there. But when we got to Triangle Island, it was a bluebird perfect day. The other thing I'll point out is because this is coming off YouTube, I can't promise that everything that's going to pop up beside the video after we might like it to be. So YouTube being YouTube, I'm, I take no responsibility. This is the aquarium's computer. Uh, so the government of Canada does not sanction anything that's showing up on here other than puffins. So with that, we will try to give this a go. And here we go. We should have some sound.
This year has been a particularly bad year. Uh, the very strong El Nino last winter. And what we found is that um, the survival of birds has been quite poor. So we started the year with about 75 burrows and we're now down to just 12 chicks. And they're not growing at all. So that indicates it's been a very, very difficult year for them. Yeah, there we go. I had a, fr I was afraid that might happen. <laughs> so, so we'll just close that right away, so as not to corrupt anybody. Now, the voice you heard on there was that of my colleague, Dr. Mark Hifner, who unfortunately was to be here to present the other half of this evening's presentation, which he is not going to be able to do. But he thoughtfully sent it to me ahead of time and asked that I do it on his behalf. So, um, I will do my best to do that. I am not a uh, seabird specialist with decades of experience working on remote seabird colonies like Mark is, but I will do my darndest. I am quite familiar with the material, but I do ask for your, uh, your indulgence there that if I'm not quite as spot on with uh, some of the information or presentation on the second part of the presentation, uh, please forgive. But I will start with this piece. So as Barry indicated, the uh, National Wildlife Area proposal has been around for a little while. I'll walk you through uh, a couple of things. One is a little bit of the kind of uh, the history of the interest in the area and what brought us to the Scott Islands. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit, we'll go into some of the seabird science and some of the interesting things that we've learned out there and then I'll go back into the management part of it. So we'll kind of go from history lesson to really neat biological science to the dusty confines of a bureaucratic planning process and back again. So hopefully that will work for you. Um, I think we've got plenty of time. Jonathan will help make sure I'm on time. If you can't hear or if you want me to clarify something, I'm perfectly happy with you with uh, asking. If it's a longer uh, answer, I will perhaps put it off to the end, or if I'm going to speak to it, uh, then I'll let you know. And with that, off we go. So I think we've covered the where on the earth of the Scott Islands part. Um, Apparently there are Scott Islands in the Caribbean around some bars and there's a few other Scott Islands in the world that will come up. So if you're, if you're looking for information on the Scott Islands, Scott Islands National Wildlife Area is the search term that you might, might want to use. I'll talk a little bit as well about why this area is just so amazing. And there's very, very few people who have been fortunate to go there. I am one of them. There's a couple of others uh, uh, around here who have done that. Um, really stupendous place and sadly it's not a place most of you will ever get to go. The islands themselves, the Triangle and Sartine and Beresford, the kind of really highly productive islands are provincial ecological reserves, they're closed to visitation. Uh, the marine environment around it is open to public access uh, but it's not an easily accessible area. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. And then as I said, I'll walk through some of the history, some of the science and some of what we intend to do. Okay, so getting there, um, go to Nanaimo, take the ferry across, turn right and drive for about five hours and you'll bump into Port Hardy at the end of the road. You can get yourself a very good cinnamon bun at Gita's Cafe whilst you wait for a boat to take you out into the protected waters and then turn left and go out past these guys of which there are a great many out there and I strongly recommend you visit that part of the world by the way if you haven't, uh, highly recommended. And you keep going left uh, through, I think it's the Galitas Channel, uh, until you get out to Cape Scott and you get past some of these beaches and this little island on the right here, Hope Island I believe it is, or Nige, Nige I think. And uh, that's the last bit of land on your right until you get to Japan. So it's a long piece of open ocean and you get out there and you get across some very, very rough water indeed. And then you bump into these islands. 
This is triangle. This is the day after a storm. So this isn't the storm. If it were a storm, you wouldn't be able to see the islands. So there they are. It's a chain of five major islands. Triangle is the one we pay most attention to because it is the one with the largest uh, breeding bird colonies on it. But Sartine and Beresford also have a good number of breeding seabirds on them. And then Lance and Cox are the ones that are actually quite close, only 11 to 15 kilometers away from the tip of Cape Scott. So if you go do uh, the hike at Cape Scott and you can get out to the lighthouse, you can see Lance and Cox Islands offshore there. They're the close ones. They're a little bit different than the outer three islands. They're bigger, they're forested, and at present have very few seabirds on them. We think largely because of introduced mammalian predators. So that's, that's the where they are piece. And it really is amazing. Um, it's a really fantastic spot. That doesn't mean it's a comfortable spot, but from a biological perspective, it's really amazing. And I'll tell you a little bit about why that is. And I, I thank uh, Gary Borstad for this, this image here that really shows the prevailing summer winds and summer currents. So on the northwest coast of British Columbia, you know summer is going to hit and you're going to get that glorious summer weather we get here on the south coast when the prevailing winds are coming from the northwest. And when the prevailing winds are coming from the northwest, that's driving upwelling and certain current flows as well that bring nutrients from the river outflows as well as from the deep water up into, and oh yes, I have no good pointing at the screen. I always make that mistake. There we go. Up into the shelf break area here. So this is the break of the continental shelf. To the, the greenish stuff here is all relatively shallow, uh, shallow water, 90, 100, 120 meters in that range. The purpley blue stuff drops down into what is known as the abyssal plain, i.e. very, very deep. Not a lot of foraging by birds going on down there. So these, these birds that we'll talk about are pretty deep and amazing divers, uh, but they do not go down to the abyssal plain and they wouldn't want to anyway because there's very few groceries there. But what happens when you get that upwelling in currents, so in this, this little inset image here, there we go, I hope it's visible, is really showing you a high current environment. You've got kelp, you've got huge shoals of, of forage fish and other things in there, and that makes for great groceries for any number of things. So every now and again you get a good day and you get to get a few pictures. This is Triangle Island, and I'll, you know, hopefully this will convey to you just what an amazing place this is. From the air, you can see it's not really a triangle, but it is from certain angles, but you can also see it's surrounded by extremely treacherous rocks. Not an easy place to approach by boat, and so I certainly don't recommend the yachting set going out there to visit it. It's an amazing place for a lot of reasons. Geographically, it's beautiful, and as I said, it's kind of the end of beyond in terms of Canada's Pacific. It's also amazing because the animal life that are on the islands themselves, but also in the waters around them. And so in the foreground here, we've got groups, a mixed group of gulls, mostly glaucous wing gulls, I think. And in the background, I don't know if you can see them very well, but sprinkled along the rocks there are these brown blobs. And that's a pretty unimpressive picture uh, of brown blobs. But those are stellar sea lions. And it's the largest stellar sea lion breeding colony, also now known as northern sea lions, now in the world. Because I understand that the Alaskan colonies are declining. And this one is steady or increasing a little bit. And let me tell you, when you have several thousand stellar sea lions uh, sitting out on the rocks, all trying to make an impression on the ladies, um, it's a noisy, noisy affair. And all you can, you can uh, it's not peaceful. So this area was identified as a really interesting area for birds a very long time ago. And if you, if you, if you have a liking of, of old nautical literature, I encourage you to pick up some. There's been some great journals of various sea captains that have been published that have worked in this area. And they all talk about how treacherous it is, how difficult it is to get around, but also the abundance of marine life. And so you see this quote from 1909, the place is infested with sea lions and all kinds of seabirds and eagles. They were probably also at that time talking about northern fur seal. Uh, 1910s, birds and puffins and gulls of many types thronged the islands. And as you saw from the aerial photos of Triangle Island, a very poor place to be a ship. And so government, to its credit, thought we should put a lighthouse on this thing to stop people from banging into it. And they did that, and they put a lighthouse on the very top of the island. You can see it up there. There's what's left of it the other half of it that is now at Souk. Stories vary a little bit as to what happened, but it's a pretty tragic story. The light was so high up on the island that most of the time it wasn't visible because it was shrouded in fog. And uh, Coast Guard's predecessor showed up one day to reprovision the lighthouse, 
And the two houses, which had previously been connected with cables so that the keeper and the assistant keeper and their families could move between the buildings during the windy days, they'd clip into it as if they were climbers, the houses were gone. So everything was gone other than the concrete base and the, and the light on top of it. So both families that were staffing this lighthouse lost in the performance of their duties. Um, there's some debate as to whether it was wind or wave based on the damage. And as you saw, it's a very high island. So it's an extremely stormy place, inhospitable to people. But for that reason, it's great for seabirds. It's isolated. No one gets out there very easily. Uh, really, really good spot for them. So people started taking note of it really early. 1898, 1909, first records from Triangle Island and some of the uh, other Scott Islands coming into the Royal BC Museum. 1949, Royal BC Museum biologists actually got out to the island to have a look. And in the 70s, uh, RBCM biologists and our own staff were out there assessing the island, trying to get a sense of, you know, how did it fit in the grand scheme of things. And in 1974, we established our first permanent field station. Uh, it's a dangerous place to work. Uh, only once have we actually forgotten to get crew back. So uh, there was one story where uh, a lonely grad student was left out there rather longer than they were supposed to have been, and three weeks or four weeks after they were supposed to have come home, the spouse phones the supervisor to say, what happened to, you know, when is he coming back? And uh, you can imagine the penny dropping at that point when he realized he'd forgotten to go pick up the grad student. We don't do that anymore. We're much more careful with our uh, occupational health and safety. But uh, it is a difficult place to get to. Communications are difficult. And it's really only been in the past few years where you've got quasi-reliable satellite phones and other kinds of safety equipment that our comfort with the safety of working on the island has gone up. Notwithstanding, you can see Dr. Hifner here wearing his helmet. That doesn't look very steep, but it is very steep. It is very slippery. People have fallen and been seriously harmed on the island. So it's something we take very seriously. It's another reason people don't go out there and that they're not invited out there. In the mid-1990s, Simon Fraser University partnered with us on a research program there, and we've been working with them since uh, out there, doing both monitoring and research. Now, I noted that we're trying to, uh, over the years, get a sense of how the Scott Islands fit into the bigger picture on the BC coast. And really, this, this image shows it all. Uh, the Triangle, Triangle Island in particular, but the Scott Islands as a group really do stand out as by far the most important colonial seabird nesting habitat in Canada's Pacific. There's no question that they are the exemplar site for us. And so it's, it's with good reason that we're putting most of our, our energy into this area right now when it comes to marine protected areas for seabirds. As you heard in the, in the video at the start, it's somewhere between 55 and 70 percent of the global population of Cassin's Auklet nest on those islands, depending on how the population is doing in a given year. Right now, one and a half million birds, roughly, on the islands, and a, and a pretty good diversity of breeding species on the islands, about a dozen. Um, so like these common murres, uh, there are parts of the island that are thick with seabirds of a variety of species. There's a, a dozen species. I'll show you a few of them. This is the biggie, and it's the one people pay the least attention to uh, for a variety of reasons, at least the general public. When you, when you think about people who might be interested in going birding and adding to their list, Cassin's Auklet might be on it, but very few people are going to be excited about it because drab little seabird enters and leaves the burrow in the pitch dark. Very few people see it. Even most fishermen who spend a lot of time on the water out there don't have any recollection of seeing these little guys because they spend a lot of time in the dark. They're nondescript. And on a dark gray ocean and a dark gray day, you're not going to see much with these little guys. But they are by far the most numerous bird in the island. The rhinoceros auklet, and I think you can see here a little nub on his bill, gives him his name. Uh, one of the other highly abundant birds in the island, I think around 100,000 of those birds on the island. Um, another focus species for us. And then the charmer of the group in terms of just plain good looks, and there's a reason uh, you've probably seen pictures of tufted puffins when it comes to Triangle Island. If you've had any interest in the, in the proposal or have any curiosity about seabirds at all, this is going to be the standout bird for you. Handsome bird. And those three are all part of a group of seabirds called alcids, which basically means short, fat birds with short, fat wings that spend all their time in the ocean. Um, and they all fly like little torpedoes. Then we have things like murres and guillemots. Uh, the guillemot on the right with the pink feet, bright red feet, pardon me. And when she opens her mouth, bright red mouth gape as well. And on the left, common murres. 
And we also have things called storm petrels out there. And for a lot of people who aren't particularly familiar with birds, uh, these might look like gulls, but they're quite a different thing. In fact, they're quite a different thing than ordinary old petrels. Uh, but we've got the fork-tailed storm petrel on the left and leeches, storm, uh, leeches petrel on the right, storm petrel on the right, both of which breed on the island. And I think maybe what I'll emphasize, and I think this is, you know, Jonathan spoke to it a little bit uh, when he gave his introduction, is I think it's really important for people to recognize that these birds are as marine organism, as marine an organism as you can get without being a fish. They spend as much time in, on, and under the water as do marine mammals. So I think that's a key thing for folks to remember that they are only on shore for a very, very tiny, a few weeks of their life history is on islands like Triangle and other scattered little rocks around the Pacific and other oceans of the world. So all the rest of the time, they're just above the water, they're in it or they're under it. And so you really do need to think of them as marine organisms. Uh, they are absolutely fundamental to marine ecosystems in terms of their impacts and contributions to it and also their reliance upon it. So a little history um, of conservation action in the area. So Triangle Island, Sartine, and Beresford Islands were all designated as provincial ecological reserves in 1971. So the fact that that happened so long ago, I think, is a strong indicator of just how important these, are, these uh, islands are ecologically. When you think that really British Columbia, who's been a leader internationally in protected areas, didn't really get started in a big, big way with multiplying and growing its protected area system until the 90s under the protected area strategy, um, where it tripled it these little islands were recognized way back then as really critical. Lance and Cox were added as provincial parks in the 90s as part of that protected area strategy and we started prospecting the site as a national wildlife area or a potential one in the late 90s and got going with some initial studies in 2003, conversations in 2004 and then as Barry indicated when he introduced me, really got the impetus to go when Budget 2007 committed Canada to putting together a proposal. And at that time it was decided that the best vehicle uh, to do that was a national wildlife area. So are we okay up until this point in terms of we got where it is, why it's really important, uh, some, of the, some of the locals that live on the island? Um, any questions at this point or are we good to carry on to the, the really egghead part of the talk which is the science which has graphs and pictures and numbers and things that will mostly speak around and so as not to uh, get people bogged down in that. We're good to go into the next piece? Seeing nods? All right, so bear with me for just a moment and I'll switch presentations here. So now, I, you know, if I was feeling a little bit more loosey-goosey about the contents of the talk, uh, I would, you know, put on a good show for you, pretending to be an, an eccentric research scientist that spends a lot of time in isolated places largely alone. However, um, because this is not my talk and I'm not intimately familiar with the details, I'll hope you'll bear with me as we work through it because I might be a little bit more mechanical moving through this piece than I might be through the other material. So Mark Hifner sends his apologies and what I'll try and do is walk you through some of the more recent parts of the research program around seabird demography. So demography is births, deaths, reproduction, that kind of stuff and how that relates to a changing environment. And actually before I do that, um, what I will say is that Mark's work is really the latest of a whole series of investigators that have been on the island and he's got a pile of publications. If you're scientifically inclined and you want to Google him, you'll find a lot of, a lot of work before him. Dr. Doug Bertram was doing a lot of work out there and a number of others have done some really seminal work, Sean Boyd and others as well. So this is really a collaborative effort. CWS. Hmm? Sadly, they're not CWS. Yes, they, they were CWS when they started and then when there's a reorganization, we won't go into that. But uh, they're still Environment Canada research scientists. Okay, so I think the real fundamental piece that Mark wants to convey with this is that there's all sorts of things that can drive demography. It can be food availability, uh, the grasslands of the savanna or the Seren and Serengeti as an example, rain, forage availability drives the migration of those great mammalian herds of the, of the Serengeti. Uh, parasites can drive demography. Uh, Bats, they move, their, they, they move roosts all the time, they get parasite loads, they try and move around a lot in order to minimize parasite loads. Predation can drive demography. Uh, there's a variety of factors that can drive demography. And one of the biggies is the physical environment. And that's very much the case with these seabirds. Population size isn't static, it's going to vary. 
and it's going to respond to that environmental variation. And really, that's the key piece in here, is that these, the, the center of this, this piece is really around how environmental uh, variation drives the demography of, in this case, Cassin's auklet and rhinoceros auklet. So the little ball of puff on the top left there, or my top left, yeah, your top left too, is a Cassin's auklet chick. And the fellow, the charmer on the right, is uh, Dr. Doug Bertram. And Doug was trying to figure out what was driving the system and how was the match between food availability, which is down here, <laughs> pointing at my monitor, not very helpful, this little critter down here, that's food, um, and how that relates to this little guy up here. And so really what it comes down to is the timing of availability of this, this little copepod here, Neocalinus cristatus, um, in a way, so how many of them are there, but critically, are they available to seabirds? Um, can they get at them when they need to get at them? And since 70, up to 70% of the global population of Cassin's auklet is in this island chain, what happens here, as, as was noted in the video, is vitally important to the status of this species worldwide. So I told you there'd be figures. This one's relatively simple to read. Um, along the top there are months, and uh, along the side is water depth, with surface being at the top, 500 meters or below at the bottom. And what you see here is the life cycle of Neocalinus cristatus and other related copepods. And the critical piece is that you see April, May, June in here, they're a good sized and they're near the surface. And by near the surface, I mean up to 90 meters below the surface. So these little seabirds can swim and dive at about 90 meters, which is, if you've done any, di anyone a diver here? Scuba diver? Yeah, a few. Anyone dove to 90 meters? No. no, not recommended, right? Very bad thing to do. These little birds are small. They can fly. They can dive to 90 meters and swim like a torpedo. And they can do that in water that is so bone chillingly cold that you put your hands in it and you can't feel it in just a few seconds. So they're kind of super powered in many respects. They're pretty amazing. Um, and what drives that for Cassin's auklet are Neocalinus copepods, but they got to be available. So here, we're getting a little bit egg-heady here. This figure is, what it's showing is where you see the zero right here, that's the 60, 65 year average ocean temperature, sea surface temperature. It's kind of a standard measure they use in oceanography. And along the bottom here, that's year, and these bars are showing whether or not the sea surface temperature in April of that year was above or below the 65 year average. And what you can see is going back to 94 is that almost all of the sea surface temperature measurements that we took in April were well above the 65 year average. But you also see there's considerable variation. I mean, you see these ones, that's not a lot, but holy cats, there's a big year there. Here's a cold year here, there's an El Nino, there's an El Nino. So there's all sorts of things happening that are driving sea surface temperature. It's not a system we understand perfectly by any means. Uh, but what this is showing is there's a lot of variation and that this was a key in trying to understand can we make the connection between that sea surface temperature variation, linkages to food webs, and the productivity for the birds. And Mark and his collaborators have done that in a very effective way. So you might ask, how do we figure out what a seabird is eating? So anyone who has an image of wildlife biology is glamorous, just needs to do this job for a day, and they will immediately decide that perhaps an office job isn't so bad. You stand out on a very steep, slippery hillside in the pouring rain in the pitch black, cold and wet, a long way from any help, a long way from a hot tub, a long way from mulled wine, any of the creature comforts that you might be thinking about on a cold, wet day. You stand there in the dark as these little guys come torpedoing in from the dark of night, and they don't see very well in the dark. But over millions of years of evolution, they're not used to having anyone stand on the hillside they're flying into, so they're not looking for anybody. So they fly into you. If you've been hit by a football, you have a sense of what it's like to be hit by a Cassin's auklet bearing along in the night. And every year, we catch a small sample of them, and we mix it up so that we're not hitting the same birds all the time, and we get them to cough up their lunch. Just once. 
and we figure out what they're eating. We send it out to a lab. This is known as gurging. Really unpleasant. Stink, stinky, stinky job. And so the figure here, you can see the dates along the bottom, and the proportion of Neocalinus cristatus in the diet is along what we call the y-axis. And what you can see is that over the course of the year, over the course of the, the breeding season, May on the left here, late June on the right, and uh, different years have different, uh, different you know, circles, triangles, so on, or different years, that in different years they're getting a different percentage of neocalinus in their diet, and that it tends to either go down or go up depending on the environmental conditions in a given year. And the, the key message here is that Neocalinus cristatus persists longer in terms of it's more available for a longer period when the ocean is cold. And that has a direct effect on the growth of these little puffballs. In cold years, cold water years, the puffballs do very well and get very fat. And in warm years, they do very poorly. That's the key message. Interestingly also, in extreme years, the survival of adult female Cassin's auklets is tremendously variable. So in these really extreme warm weather years, they don't do well. This doesn't happen to the males. Males seem to do okay. The females, major population crashes. And typically in alcids, so puffins and these kinds of guys, uh, auklets, puffins, adult survival is very, very high. And they're very long-lived birds, 20 plus years. And so Having a 50% reduction in, in the female population or a 30% reduction in one year because of something that we don't understand is troubling. But it does seem to be related to the really extreme warm sea surface temperature years, but we don't know what yet. And I say yet because we're feeling fairly confident that we will eventually figure that part out. So the question for Cassin's auklet is, if the oceans are going to continue to warm, which they look like they're doing, uh, are we going to get more of these extreme climate events? And is that going to drive demographics for Cassin's auklet, both in terms of food availability, so a warm year, less availability of neocalinus, as well as a higher potential risk of catastrophic population decline for female adults? Cold year, a bonanza. Very different demographic cycle than the, what they've been accustomed to. And I will point out, sea surface temperature isn't just a driver. Uh, for alcids like Cassin's auklet, but also for this guy. Anyone know what that is? Black oyster catcher, excellent. You know how to describe it to someone if they're asking you, you know, I saw this crazy bird. It's a crow wearing rubber boots smoking a carrot. Okay, so that's, that's the black oyster catcher. Not good neighbors during the breeding season. They're very noisy. So anyway. Warm sea surface temperatures also correlated with bad years for black oyster catcher in the Scott Islands. So again, we don't, in this instance, don't know the driver, uh, but possibly something similar. So now there's rhinoceros auklet. Remember, easy one to identify. He's got this horn-like thing growing off the top of his bill. And a lot of alcids uh, are hard to see on the BC coast if you like to go watch birds. But one good spot to see these guys is off uh, southern Vict uh, Victoria uh, in the winter. You'll see the occasional one there. And also on the ferry out to Cortez Island in the winter, you'll see the occasional one out there. They're a little bit more drab in the winter, but you can, you can see them. So if you like to find hard-to-see birds, those are two good places to go find this guy. So at first, we were thinking kind of the same thing must be driving rhino auklets. Um, and so we looked. And what did we find? Well, again, this graph, April sea surface temperatures, degrees Celsius on the bottom. And uh, you can see, you know, how, are the, how is breeding success going with these guys and not going very well? Uh, but then there's these outliers. I keep pointing at my monitor. That's not helpful. Outliers like 2007. It's strange. So it doesn't seem to be uh, quite as perfect. So the fit isn't as good. So we thought that sea surface temperature was operating much the same way. Um, but because 2007 was such a serious outlier, and something similar had happened in 1976, where we would have predicted a banner year for them, but didn't get it. So even though it was nice and cold in 2007, rhinos didn't do well. So you've seen this uh, one of these slides already, the one on the right, the summer. 
And on the BC coast, the exact opposite prevailing conditions, uh, uh, pardon me, the exact opposite uh, wind and current conditions prevail in the winter. So in the winter, the prevailing winds are from the southeast, and you get the opposite response. You get downwelling. So you get surface water going deep instead of deep water coming to the surface and then it reverses itself. And so the timing and strength of that transition varies from year to year. When you get conditions right, you get the summer upwelling at the right time, and it occurs at the same time you're getting longer, warmer days, and you get these big plankton blooms and lots of groceries for everything that's in the water. Now, I apologize that this is satellite imagery and it's a wee bit grainy and it's gonna be hard for you to see, but I draw your attention to 2007. This is the north end of Vancouver Island here. And then here's 2008. 2007, cold year, and I should say what this is showing. It's showing um, spring plank plankton blooms as seen from space, which is kind of impressive, actually, that we can see plankton blooms from space. And uh, the, the newer imagery is even more impressive. But you could see 2007, we showed you earlier, cold year, but where's the plankton? 2008, similar year, cold-wise, look at all the plankton. Lots of good stuff going on in 2008, not in 2007. So we know that a strong bloom leads to successful breeding. Uh, you can see on the, on the left is production, and that's how fat the chicks are. And then along the bottom axis there, mean April chlorophyll production, and that's milligrams per cubic meter of, or cubic, yeah, cubic meter of water. That's the chick on the right, that's the adult on the left. That chick is gonna do well. Big fat chick, almost the same size as the adult. That's good, that's what we like to see. And we kinda of think we got this, this figured out a little bit because what happens is the key thing is when the wind shifts and how it shifts. Um, this little guy, this strange wee fish, anyone know what it is? Sandlet, very impressive. So this little guy is a fish that is absolutely fundamental to the food web of the Northeast Pacific, i.e. our part of the Pacific, and it's a species about which almost nobody knows anything in this part of the world. There are some fisheries on it in Northwest Europe and so on on related species, but in this part of the world, we know very, very little about it, and everything eats it. Uh, it's one of the key forage fish of the entire coast, and when I mean everything, I mean everything. Everything from fish not much bigger than it the humpback whales, everything eats this thing. Sea lions, seabirds, whales, fish, everything. Um, and as it turns out, these guys are really critical for rhinoceros auklet, not for Cassin's auklet. Cassin's auklet, you might recall, eat copepods. Rhino auklets eat these wee fish. And uh, that's the percentage of biomass of uh, of sand lance caught in Fisheries and Oceans Canada's research trawls when they're looking to see how salmon are doing, and they also get some sand lance. And that's chlorophyll. And what it's showing is a very tight relationship to the amount of chlorophyll in the water with sand lance, and that's because sand lance go out and eat plankton. So chlorophyll does well, you get a big plankton bloom, sand lance go eat plankton. And so we get more sand lance in nestling diets in those years where we have higher chlorophyll in April. And the local abundance of sand lance picked up in DFO trawls um, is highly predictive. And this CPUE here, don't be scared off by the log uh, in there if you get nervous around math. This is All this is showing is that when DFO is doing research trawls for salmon fingerlings and so on, uh, they're also catching sand lance, and they get more of it when the chlorophyll is higher. Now, unlike I was talking earlier, Cassin's auklet, uh, they don't seem to have any, any changes in adult survival at all when there's a big environmental variation. So you remember those years like 2007 and, and so on, huge variation in, in sea surface temperature, big variation during extreme weather, uh, sea surface temperature events for female Cassin's auklet, and you can see not much going on for rhino auklets there. Not a big driver for them. Okay, so um, the general picture then. Rhinoceros auklet eat sand lance. Sand lance eat plankton. 
plankton does better in high chlorophyll years, and high chlorophyll years are dependent on when the wind shifts. And the, when the wind shifts depends on how much productivity we get. So now Mark and his colleagues are able to actually look and have a very strong predictive power, whether it's going to be a good year for rhinos or a poor year for rhinos, based on how late in the summer the wind shifts over. And that's pretty neat. Um, there are very, very few uh, studies out there with that kind of predictive power. So this is really high-end science. You should be very pleased with Dr. Hifner and his collaborators for coming up with this. And that's work with Fisheries and Oceans Canada and some other research groups around the province who have come out with this work. Now, one of the really interesting things I will point out um, is that there is also a relationship to, uh, to salmon, as it turns out. I'm not asking you to read this battery of graphics on the right. But really, the key thing to remember here is you might recall that um, in 2007, the uh, Fraser Sockeye cohort that went out to sea in 2007 <coughs> largely disappeared. In 2008, great big cohort. And what's really interesting is that matches with rhino auklet successes in those years. And so we're feeling a little bit cocky that we can use and give a little bit of advance warning that based on how rhinoceros auklet are doing on Triangle Island is going to give us an indicator of the amplitude of the sockeye salmon return, the Fraser sockeye salmon return. So it's all part of the same big system. You've got salmon out there, and it's not that rhinos are eating salmon that big, I should point out. I've had that question before. Uh, we do not have five or eight rhino auklets all ganging up to take out a full-size sockeye. What we've got is that, as I noted earlier, it's the whole food web, and they're all related. So, and what we fact, in fact found in a very, very big sockeye years, rhinoceros auklet were for the first time eating a lot of small salmon, juvenile salmon. So uh, during those big years, we can actually tell when there's going to be a lot of fish out there because the rhinos are actually bringing them back. And it's the same dynamic, we think, that's driving success. So that is, uh, is uh, Mark's thank you list for his many, many top-notch field assistants. There's been a, a cycle of people who have really earned their bona fides as seabird scientists out with the Triangle Research Program. And uh, making sure, and, that's, and that looks like Saul Schneider there fixing the outhouse. So um, at any rate, so that's the basics of the science sketch. Now, if you have questions about the science, uh, you can either ask them now or hold, or we, maybe, maybe we'll hold. I don't see people like itching to ask questions. We'll move on to the management bit. Am I OK for time still? OK. And then we can get on with any questions that might be out there. All right. Okay. All right. So there's Mark. That is not a typical day of research on Triangle Island. It's not raining, and he's not on a steep slope. So I don't know what he's doing there that day, but it looks pretty good. I think he must be doing oyster catchers. They, they like to hang out right down by the water. So, Okay, so as I said, we'll kind of get into a little bit of the, the dusty process and policy piece. I'll try and make it undusty for you to make it, uh, you know, make sure you understand how it's relevant, how we're doing things. And, you know, in the past, we used to create protected areas in Canada by someone in an office a long way away from where that protected area was signing something. And today, someone in a long, far away office still has to sign something to create a protected area, but the process by which we get there is very, very different indeed. In the old days, you would have someone do a train trip out somewhere and think, wow, this area is great. We should make a park and they would write a letter to their friend and they would say, you're right, we should make a park, it'll be good for tourism, and they make a park and it's done. There's no public consultation, there's no biological study, there's no science behind it. That is not the way it works anymore. So we'll talk about how that process works a little bit now with this particular example and, uh, and talk about some of the management approaches we're proposing to take should the area be ultimately designated. So first I've mentioned a national wildlife area a couple of times, Barry mentioned it when he gave his introduction. Uh, quick primer then perhaps might be useful because I think probably everyone in the audience is comfortable with the concept of a national park but perhaps not with a national wildlife area. So it's a creature of the Canada Wildlife Act which is one of the pieces of legislation that the Wildlife Service is responsible for delivering upon and uh, the regulations allow us to create national wildlife areas both terrestrially and in the marine environment all the way out to the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone limit. So terrestrial or marine environments from low tide 
all the way out. Um, currently we have 54 national wildlife areas in Canada, totaling about a million hectares. We also have another type of protected area called a migratory bird sanctuary, a much older uh, uh, example, and they actually constitute the oldest marine protected areas in Canada. There's some of them that go back all the way to the 1920s. Most of those ones are quite small. Uh, there are some very large migratory bird sanctuaries, particularly in the Arctic. And what I like to emphasize to people is that a national wildlife area can be both very strict but also very flexible. And that sounds like a bit of a contradiction, but essentially the way the regulations are written allow you to be outcome focused. So you can say, for example, and I'll, I'll, I'll use two nearby terrestrial examples, Vaso Bighorn National Wildlife Area, south of Penticton, we really manage as a strictly protected area. There's no real public access except for in one little small spot. Uh, no other activities are permitted on the site. We don't do tours. Um, you know, no farming, no ranching, none of that happens on the property. No hunting. The Alaxan National Wildlife Area, which is right beside the Rifle Migratory Bird Sanctuary out there in Westham Island, and actually overlaps it. So if you go to the, the Rifle Sanctuary and you pay your ticket to get in, you're actually on the National Wildlife Area as well. Um, that property, the, the Alaxan part of it, we manage as a farm. And we manage as a farm in order to provide uh, compensation habitat, for lack of a better term, for migratory waterfowl and wintering waterfowl because we can actually provide more food for those animals managing it as a sustainable farm than if we were to leave it natural because the changes in the estuary have been so enormous that if we were to just leave it natural we'd have fewer calories available for those animals. So you can do both under the National Wildlife Area System and what you do is depending on what conservation objectives you're trying to achieve. So it's both the strictest conservation protection in the country and the most flexible. So the key with the Scott Islands is that we're actually interested in protecting the ocean foraging area. Well, you'll remember that we talked about earlier, the islands themselves are already protected under provincial legislation. So this, this proposal is about protecting the marine environment. And we're using the research that's been done since the 1970s and our understanding of the marine ecology in the area to inform how we should go about doing that. This image is really kind of a neat one here. We've got a common myrrh, and as, as the, uh, the caption says, Mr. Mom. So this is a really neat piece, and I'll show you an image a little bit later, but when myrrh chicks fledge, they hang out with dad, and they swim. They have a swimming migration to a different part of the coast. And we've actually got some really interesting data, and we'll show you a, a map in a moment, where the chicks follow dad from Triangle Island back towards the mainland coast. And so we're trying to capture that and other kinds of information and how we define the boundary for the area. So key criteria. First and foremost, uh, trying to make sure we're really focusing on the birds that breed on the Scott Islands as the real drivers. We're looking at socioeconomic issues and other planning processes. So there's other marine planning processes that are going on the coast, national marine conservation areas that are driven by Parks Canada, Fisheries and Oceans Canada has some marine pl uh, conservation planning they're doing as well. And we're looking at the marine environment within about 65 kilometers of Triangle Island. And that's because that's about the average distance that Casson's Auklet will go and come back on a single foraging round from those islands. And we've had certain people say, well, that's a very long way. Maybe you should shrink that. But then we can point out that some of the storm petrels and shearwaters that are on the island will go 200 kilometers away. So it's a bit of a compromised distance in terms of how far out we should be looking. And I'll show you some images in, in shortly that makes me think we got it, got it fairly right for our focal species, which is really the Casson's auklet. We use straight lines. You're going to see the image shortly that talks about the proposed boundary. It's a very large area. But in order to facilitate uh, an easy understanding for mariners to know whether they're in the marine wildlife area or out, straight lines help people with charting and so on. As I said, the national wildlife area is the wet part, so low tide and down, and uh, where it makes sense whether it abuts up against existing protected areas like, for example, Cape Scott Provincial Park. That's the tufted puffin, which for my money is probably the handsomest seabird you'll find anywhere. Um, and as I said, we're focusing on those seabirds that rely the most on the islands themselves. I've mentioned the number about one and a half million a few times. That's about the number of birds that breed on the islands. Seabirds using the area around it are probably about five million uh, during the summer season. So there's a lot of seabirds other than the breeders uh, that are using this area. But what we're using to drive the boundary delineation and the management considerations at the start of the process are the breeders. And of those breeders, the ones for whom that area is particularly important, like Casson's Auklet and Tufted Puffin.
So that's the boundary. That's the proposed boundary for the National Wildlife Area. Very large, uh, about 1.1 million hectares. And it's a consultation boundary. So as I'll refer a little later on, uh, there's a public consultation going on right now. And if you wish to feed into that, you can go there and read the draft regulatory strategy and give your input. There's a few key spots on the map. Triangle Island is there in the middle. That's Lance and Cock. Port Hardy is just over there. Um, you can see the shelf break really nicely in this image. That's the continental shelf break and the abyssal plain down here. And uh, this area just up here is known as Cook Bank. That's really important for rhinoceros auklet that are going after sand lands. Upwelling is important out here. And that's where you'll find a lot of Cassin's uh, auklet. So I've mentioned these guys are a top priority for us. The image on the left, you don't need to spend your time trying to read all that imagery. Uh, key message is that the red hotspots are the places where we were finding the most Cassin's auklet over three years of radio telemetry, as well as at sea surveys. And that is your typical Cassin's auklet burrow. So when you want to get Cassin's auklet to weigh them and see how they're doing, you've got to be reaching your arm all the way down the burrow and gently hauling them out of there. And so when we drew the boundary uh, for consultation on the proposed national wildlife area, we wanted to be as sure as we could that we were really doing a good job of capturing those parts of the ocean environment that were really important to Cassin's auklet. And so you can see the bright red dots are the at-sea survey information uh, that have been um, uh, generalized to make it a little easier to read. And then the black dots are radio telemetry. So you can see that there's other places that Cassin's auklet use up and down the coast. And there are other breeding colonies of Cassin's auklet up and down the coast. But the mother load is really in this area here. Tufted puffin. 90% of Canada's population of tufted puffin breed on the islands. So we wanted to make sure we got that. And again, at sea survey data, very intensive use around the islands. Rhinoceros auklet. Not quite as handsome as some of the other seabirds, but notwithstanding his modest looks, um, key seabird site, a key seabird for Canada. Canada has a very significant population of, cast, uh, of rhino auklets. Triangle Island is one of a number of important colonies. But there are other colonies that are bigger, and you can actually see in here, these are not Triangle Island birds. Those are uh, Pine Island birds, I believe. So we're wanting to make sure we're doing good things for rhinos, because Triangle is important for rhinos, but it's not as a high priority as it is for Cassins or Puffins. We've got common murres here. Common murr are not an especially abundant bird on the BC coast. They're much more abundant up in Alaska. But in terms of the Canadian population, about 90% of them breed on Triangle. And you can see this is the data I was referring to earlier. They're breeding on Triangle. The chicks fledge. They hang around a while. And then they all migrate along the north end of Vancouver Island and get into the Broughton Archipelago in this area and spread up and down the coast. So we wanted to make sure that the boundary was protecting some of that area because when the chicks are on the water, particularly when they're new, they're not especially strong swimmers, uh, hard for them to... Uh, to adapt to any kind of problems. Yes, question. Yes, so they breed on Triangle and spend a very short period of time there. And then as soon as the chicks, these little puff balls, are in the water, uh, they're off with dad. And they really, once they're in the drink, they spend a couple of days at most hanging around the waters around Triangle and then off they go. Leech's storm petrel. Again, you can see a big hot spot here. We're catching some of it there. Not entirely sure if these are triangle birds or not. Uh, don't think so. And another big concentration here, again, not thinking that those are triangle birds. Could be, but hard to tell. Are those concentrations constant, or are they changing species? The, this, that's an excellent question. So what I should have said when I talked about these kind of blended maps here is that these are showing uh, at-sea survey data uh, over a 20-year period that have been averaged. So it's the 20-year average that you're seeing here with a weighting towards the more recent stuff because we expect that ocean conditions 20 years ago were not probably not as good a predictor as what ocean conditions 5 and 10 years ago were for what might be in the future. So this will be averaged over the breeding season over a 20-year period. Thanks, good question. My apologies for not clarifying that earlier. Okay, so there's some challenges to doing a very large marine protected area. Maybe I'll, you know, I can remind you again just how big that is. I mean, that's a 
a very, very large area. Um, Tanchinchini Wilderness Park up in northwestern British Columbia is about a million hectares. Banff is under that. Jasper is about that. The whole Wells Gray complex is about 800,000. So very substantial area. So there's some challenges to doing that. So as I said, we may think of it as the back of beyond, but the people who live and work up there certainly do not. And so there's lots of people doing stuff up there that have an interest in what we're proposing to do. So we need to be sensitive to that. As I mentioned, some of these birds go vast, vast distances. And so we can't capture all the important sites, and we have to set priorities. Um, there are other birds out here, other than the ones that breed on the islands, that we care about. Things like albatross that breed in Hawaii or Japan that are using this area. Um, shearwaters that are breeding in Chile that use this area. But we can't possibly use a protected area to capture everything that's related to those species' needs uh, because they cover such vast, vast distances. So we will use other things to help deal with some of the other issues. And we may well use other protected areas in other parts and work with our international partners to do that. Uh, so we have to set priorities as best we can. There's also constitutionally protected First Nations right, that we must respect. Uh, the research cabin on Triangle Island is built on top of a shell midden. So notwithstanding the really nasty sea conditions to get out there, there's lots of evidence that First Nations people for a long, long time were going out in those waters to get out to Triangle Island to take advantage of that big protein source, all those birds on the islands. Um, and we actually just worked with the Tlatlatsikula and Quatsino First Nations this past summer to do an investigation of archaeology on Lance and Cox Islands. And we haven't got the final results, but there are certainly lots of seabirds in the bones in the middens of those sites as well. So whether they were going out to Triangle on a foraging trip and bringing everything back to Lansing Cox, which would be my suspicion because Triangle's pretty unhospitable, um, or whether they were actually eating what was present on, on Lansing Cox, I don't know. But certainly they were using seabirds as a resource. And so we need to be cognizant of that as well. And then a good process depends on people working with you. So you need to make sure that you're doing your consultations well and you're dealing with other government departments well and other stakeholders that have an interest in the area. So those are all challenges when you've got the fishing industry and the marine transportation industry and other kinds of industries that might be interested in economic development in that area. A group of black oyster catchers. You don't often see collections of black oyster catchers like this, but you do out on Triangle. Um, right now, the evidence that the current economic activity that's happening within the boundaries of the National Wildlife Area, the evidence that that are causing real problems for the birds isn't there. And so really, I think it's important to frame this in your mind that the, uh, the National Wildlife Area proposal is really a proactive measure at this point in time to ensure that it continues to be a very highly productive marine environment that provides all the groceries necessary for the marine wildlife in the area. And so it's about managing possible future threats and impacts rather than really present impacts that we're concerned about. So how do we do that? Well, what we're proposing to do is a model that's a little bit more uh, closer to the Alaxan National Wildlife Area than it is to the Vaso Bighorn National Wildlife Area, at least at this stage. So we're taking about, talking about doing what we call an adaptive management approach, which is you grandfather in the stuff that's happening there now, and you do more, more monitoring and more research to see how that might be having an effect on the marine environment. And if you learn that it is having an effect, then you tweak your regulations over time to reduce or eliminate that effect. If you learn that it's not having an effect, then great, you've found compatible uses, people who can be going out there and doing things like you know, fishing that are not having an impact of a measurable type on the marine environment can continue to do that in that area. It's kind of a win-win scenario. Um, the contrary is, if you find that there is a problem, then we have the information necessary to back it up and do something about it. We're intending to develop a management plan cooperatively with First Nations and other government agencies like Fisheries and Oceans and the province of BC that have an interest in the area. And we've actually got started on that now so that when designation happens, we'll have a management plan more or less ready to go. Um, and I mentioned the con current uses. The proposed boundary would uh, constitute about 2.5% of Canada's exclusive economic zone. So a fairly big chunk and would make a significant contribution to meeting Canada's commitment to protect 10% of its marine environment. So in the short term, the benefits of an NWA designation would be more science, more monitoring, better information, which can help improve management both in that site and elsewhere on the coast where there might be similar conditions. More monitoring. You've seen this big red plane a couple of times in a couple of our pictures. Um, that's a Dash 8 
aircraft that's operated by Transport Canada and Environment Canada jointly, and it does pollution uh, surveys. Uh, it has like a little RTD2 in the nose and the belly of it that has all sorts of sensitive sensors in it as well as other stuff under the wings. It's very, very good at detecting uh, spills. And one of our other scientists, Dr. Patrick O'Hara, is experimenting on using some of that technology for actually monitoring seabirds, which would be a great boon if that actually is successful because it would save a lot of time and money and give us a whole lot more information on where birds are at sea. Um, there would also be higher levels of review for any proposed activities that might occur in or around the protected area, which would be very good from our perspective. And it provides real opportunities for increased public awareness around the area and the species that are using it. And then it also, I think, in a small way, increases the probability of being able to get some resources to address uh, invasive species, mink and raccoon, that were introduced onto Lance and Cox Islands uh, earlier in the 19th century, uh, pardon me, in the 20th century, that have had, we think, a really devastating effect on seabirds that used to breed on those islands. And so an example of the added science that can be brought to bear because of the NWA designation is this project here that we're working on with our colleagues at the Canadian Hydrographic Service. Those are the guys who do the charts. That those of you who are mariners, you should know and love the Canadian Hydrographic Service. They do excellent work and they're working with us on this project to map the sea bottom in and around the Scott Island groups and eventually within the entire boundary of the National Wildlife Area to try and determine key habitats, bottom types. And in particular, we're really keenly interested in where are the habitat types that are really important for forage fish like sand lands? They have a very particular bottom type that we think they like to spawn in and also that they like to bury themselves in for security cover. And so we want to be able to know where those are so that we can manage any activities that are happening in the National Wildlife Area to minimize impacts on those sites. And as I said earlier, you know, we have species like albatross that come from all over the world, really all the way across the Pacific. We're not going to be able to manage just for albatross in an area like the Scott Islands National Wildlife Area, even for something like short-tailed albatross like this guy, which is a, a threatened species under the Species at Risk Act, because the breeding islands are so far away, the territory they cover is so vast. But what we will be able to do is get more information on what seabird use is happening in the National Wildlife Area, pilot measures that might be beneficial for them, and so on. So we can use it as a bit of a test bed. And I think uh, only a couple more slides. Talked a little bit already about the National Wildlife Area proposal, that it's open for comment. You can Google uh, regulatory strategy, Scott Islands National Wildlife Area, something like that, and you should find it. If you have a hard time, and I guess you're on Jonathan's mailing list, you can certainly get a hold of me and we can make sure you find your way there. But I do encourage you, if you have an interest in this, please do participate in that consultation. Once this consultation occurs, uh, we'll take any feedback we've received from the public and any stakeholders we haven't spoken to yet. If appropriate, accommodate that in the proposal and then put it up for what's known as Gazette 1, which is the final kick at the cat for public to consult on this document before it goes to Gazette 2 and gets finalized. And with that, i am finished the official uh, formal presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to do my best to answer them. Thanks. Questions? <laughs> Sir? Okay, so what's the timeline as far as the future is concerned? Yep, so we're at, uh, the consultation ends, I think, on the 25th of May. We're then going to take, pardon me? Oh, yes, thanks. So consultation ends on the 25th of May, and then we'll take some, a couple of months to look at the comments that have come in over that, depending on the volume of those, accommodate those if necessary or if appropriate, in the uh, draft regulatory strategy, and then go to what's known as Gazette 1. And Gazette 1 is the process by which we make an amendment to the, the regulations of the Canada Wildlife Act, which would formally create the area. We would then have the formal proposal on the Government of Canada's website for saying, we're going to do it, last chance to comment. Uh, and then uh, Gazette 2 is when it gets finalized. So in terms of that actual process, once it goes to Gazette 1, we're obliged for another 60 days uh, to have it up on Gazette 1. And so we're hoping, fingers are crossed, maybe Ocean's Day next year, which is in June. That's what we're shooting for. Uh, the Public Service doesn't make the final decision on when to sign off on these kinds of things. That is also a ministerial decision, but that's what we're hoping for. Yeah. 
So question, is there other similar protected areas around the world in terms of the adaptive management approach? Is that, yeah. yeah. And you know, how effective are they? So there are a few, and in fact, quite a few. Most marine protected areas that have been designated recently around the world have zones that are strict protection as well as other stuff can happen in them. So if you look down just the Pacific coast of North America, there's several that were created in the United States under the Bush administration, just in the dying days of that administration. And most of those have a zone in them that is strict, as well as a much larger zone that allows other activities to go on in them. And so they're all pretty new, and marine protected areas are pretty new. And so it's a little difficult to determine how much success has been had to date. The, some of the oldest ones are in New Zealand waters, and those ones have tended to be smaller and quite strict in their protection, and certainly those have had significant effects on, uh, on fish populations. And that's what most people have looked at in most protected areas has been focused on fish. We're only aware of one other example where marine birds were the real driver in the designation, and that was actually for penguins in South Africa. Uh, and that actually has been shown to be very successful. Uh, so it'll be, it's going to take some time, and that's part of the adaptive management approach. It is a longer uh, term approach. One of the things I should say is one of the advantages of the adaptive management approach, the disadvantages is more complicated than a strict everybody out of the pool kind of response. Um, one of the advantages is that you're not entirely certain in environments like the one that we're operating in whether any human activities in there are detrimental or positive for the marine environment. It's not always, I think our default is that any activity will be bad, but that isn't always the case. Uh, often, but not always. And so the approach we're hoping to take is hopefully going to give us some information as to whether or not uh, the kinds of things that are happening there are either detrimental or potentially positive to the area. So it will take some time to actually figure out if the approach is successful or not. But I think at least in this instance, will actually be paying attention and monitoring and measuring to see if what we're doing is right. Other questions? Yes, ma'am? Can you have uh, much idea at this point about what fishing activities are actually going on around on the line and in particular? Like what types of fish, where they live, yep. et cetera, et cetera? So the question is, do we have a very good idea around what kinds of fishing activities and fish populations, et cetera, around those islands? I think the answer is, for certain species, we have a very good idea. So things like rockfish and salmon and tuna and these kinds of things that are part of you know, traditionally commercially harvested species, fisheries and oceans, Canada has pretty good data. I mean, notwithstanding managing fisheries resources is extremely complicated, challenging kind of black box process when you can't look into the ocean as clearly as you'd like to, pretty good information on those. And you know, some of the fisheries that happen in that area, a number of the fisheries that happen in that area have been certified um, by the Marine Stewardship Council and so on based on their sustainability. For others like sand lance, Pacific soury, which are these little forage fish, um, very, very, very little information. And so that's one of the things that we want to be working with Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the academic community to try and get a better handle on those species. So there are a number of fisheries that are active in the area. There are no net fisheries in the Triangle and Scott Islands area. There's a rockfish conservation area, i.e. a closure, around most of the inner islands. Uh, and most of the proposed uh, protected area is presently part of an, uh, an agreement between the bottom fishing industry and fisheries and oceans and the environment sector as a closure. So most of the area is closed to bottom trawl now. Uh, a good chunk of it is closed to rockfish fisheries. There are no net fisheries. There are some trap fisheries and halibut fisheries, and there's also sport fishing that operates out of places like Winter Harbor and Coal Harbor and so on. Other questions? Sir? Uh, we keep getting money to do work on Scott Islands. So uh, we have publications coming out of the work that's happening on Scott Islands. Uh, so you know, we've had our colleagues and other, um, other departments ask us, how do you keep getting mentioned in the budget? And uh, you know, I think it's a well, you know, we've got 30 years of science behind the project. We've got a lot of interest in the area. And we're taking an approach that is both adaptive and responsive to what local communities are interested in. So I would say when it comes to 
doing seabird silence in the seabird science on the Scott Islands. It's a, they say that three times fast. Um, and getting continued support to proceed, I haven't noticed any impact for the Scott Islands program. Jonathan? Um, in the work that's being done up there with this proposed um, wildlife area, should it be applied in other parts of Canadian waters where maybe we see more impacts to based Yeah. Uh, so the question is, can we apply our experience in the Scott Islands to other parts of the British Columbia coast or other, other waters elsewhere where there might be a more imminent threat uh, to conservation? I mean, I think yes is the answer. As I noted, you know, we've got 30 years of science in this area. And unlike almost anywhere else in the country, we have this predictive ability to understand what's driving rhinoceros and cass and zocalet populations based on prevailing environmental conditions. So. You know, we don't necessarily have the same really strong science all over the coast. Um, you, can't, you can't do that kind of science everywhere, and so we have it here and we're applying it there. What I think you can apply is the approach we've taken to establishing the National Wildlife Area, which we've received a lot of kudos on, even from stakeholder sectors that have some concerns about the proposal. And that is really a honest, eyes open approach that is really outcomes based as opposed to being kind of prescriptive even when you're not sure what that prescription might result in. And so if you go into a process where you are generally, genuinely in a consultative frame of mind and you take the time to talk to people in a structured way while at the same time being clear, we have marching orders, we've been told to get it ready, this is what we are doing, but we genuinely do want your input to try and make it work. Um, then I think you're more likely to have success than you would if you go in with an entirely confrontational attitude. So certainly any time you have a protected areas proposal, there are interests that feel threatened, there are people who have different perspectives on how it should happen and all that kind of thing, and the only way you can move through that successfully is to have clear government direction, which we have for Scott Islands, and a process where people feel they've been heard. And a, good, a whole pile of good science doesn't hurt. Have you received marching orders for any other area recently? We've been asked, and we've said we kind of have our hands full with this one. So um, there are, there's interest in other national wildlife areas of this type. And in Arctic Canada, uh, in the Northwest Territories in particular, First Nations up there in particular are quite interested in the national wildlife area model. And in fact, there are some that are kind of proceeding along that would be substantial marine protected areas with a terrestrial component as well. Um, so there are some that moving along, I think we're the furthest advanced. And we're continuing yeah, absolutely. And Barry reminds me that we're continuing to participate in coast-wide marine protected areas planning. As I intimated earlier, there are three federal agencies that are involved in marine protected areas, Environment Canada, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and Parks Canada, all using different legislation. I think some might be inclined to think that that's a bit redundant. But in fact, they all have rather different mandates. You know, Parks Canada is about representation of marine, marine ecological regions. Environment Canada has got a, a, a good focus on, on hot spots, particularly for seabirds and other things. And Fisheries and Oceans Canada is looking at a, at a diverse set of marine biodiversity. So they're, they all make sense. And we all do work together quite closely and collaboratively on that. So we're continuing to participate in that. And that process involves consultation all up and down the coast. Um, and so as sites are identified as of very high value, then the different agencies involved, including the province and First Nations, have the conversation about what is the best tool to use to try and protect that. So for now, we've said, give us a break. We've got to try and get this one done first. Once this one's done, then we'll be open to conversations about other ones. Is another question there? No? Yes, sir. I think, as I noted, there's concern from a number of sectors. And depending on who you talk to and what sector, you can get more or less concern. So for example, the commercial fishing sector has said to us that we've run a great process. They feel heard. They feel that we accommodated some of their interests. They're still nervous. Um, likewise, um, offshore oil and gas has expressed interest in what we're doing. There are a number of exploration permits that were issued there in the 1970s. And so there's interest in their part in, well, what would that mean for offshore oil and gas exploration should the moratorium ever be lifted? Um, 
And then the, the last big one is really the marine transportation sector, wanting to be really clear on, you know, uh, you've got a lot of shipping that goes in that area. I think people often forget uh, the Port of Metro Vancouver is the largest port in the Americas, by far the largest port in Canada. Um, a lot of shipping comes out of here, and everything that's going Trans-Pacific is going near or by or through that existing area. So they're definitely watching it and have been participating in our stakeholder group uh, advisory group to try and make sure that you know the things that they can contribute to it so that we can think about their concerns and address them so for example uh, we use straight lines which biologists don't tend to do very much engineers do but biologists almost never do but in this instance we use straight lines when going to de do the boundary designation because that's way easier for mariners to keep track of when are they in when are they out um, and to have it represented on charts so things like that and they actually have been quite progressive about things like the big red airplane doing pollution monitoring because they want to make sure that their industry is not getting a bad name because if they are getting a bad name then they know there's going to be more regulation coming in so they have generally been very constructive all three of those groups have been generally constructive contributors to the advisory group any last questions okay well thanks very much appreciate your attention